You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And today, I just really wanted to check in on this guy, uh, Jake Harshman. I haven't had him on in a while, just, just to talk. No promos or anything, but just to have some talking. We'll have some promoing stuff, but like just talking fishing and what's been going on in his world. Because um, I, think, I think the last time I talked to you was about literally, I think it was the Bassmaster MKBA like Bugabaloo event that you had with um, mm-hmm. Nolan Minor winning. I think that's what it was. No, it wasn't. Was you're that? all fucking. You're all over the place, bro. I, I am. <laughs> it's well, first. It's M A M A K B F Mid Atlantic Kayak Bass Fishing. Series. I'd rather just do Mid Atlantic because acronyms just freaking are terrible. That's why. Let, let's just let's just call it the Mid Atlantic. Let's do right? Mid Atlantic. Yeah. Um, it was the Bassmaster Series, and Ewing Minor won it, not Nolan. Well, shit. Okay, so I'm gonna go put myself in the retirement home Joe Biden is in right now because <laughs> I didn't get any of that shit right. But we're nope, gonna keep this. Sure didn't. We're gonna keep some sure of this didn't. ready for the memeing. Holy Christ! Sure um, with all that said, <laughs> how much fishing have you been doing, and and really, like, what have you been up to since then? Um, I mean, I've been getting out. Um, I've been I've been getting out doing some fishing. Right now, it's it's the river is insane. The river is is fishing so good right now because of the fall. Um, you know, the, the, the big fish have grouped up and, you know, you'll come up onto a spot and you'll catch one big fish and you'll see 20, 20 more with it. Um, maybe not 20. Um, but there's a, there's large groups of big fish that are, that are together. Um, they're feeding really well. And un- unfortunately the only downside is the river's super low right now. I would love to see the river come up a little bit, but um, yeah, the fish are the fish are doing what they should be doing, and and it's fishing really good right now. That is so crazy with the hurricane that came through. That I I just and maybe it's because like down the Potomac River, it's funny. I think you, I don't know if you've seen the pictures of Harper's Ferry. The Shenandoah is literally just mud blown the hell out, and then the Potomac's clean. And it's so weird how like yeah. it just missed. This area. Well, didn't yeah, didn't that storm like kind of come up and then go back out? Yeah, it hooked towards the Mississippi, kind of. Yeah, I think. But that's just interesting to me uh, that that you guys didn't get, which is good though, because I think uh, there's a couple of big tournaments. You have yours coming up here soon uh, this weekend for the Mid Atlantic, and then you have that uh, big bass blast thing that Native is putting on too, right? As well, whatever yeah, the hell that's called. The big the the big black bass. No, <laughs> yeah, it's um so. We have yeah we we have two tournaments coming up. The first one is is a it's a big tournament, but it's not big in numbers. Um, you had to qualify to get into this one. That's this weekend, um, Susquehanna River. It's it's a, a more specific stretch of the Susquehanna River from basically Harrisburg to Goldsboro, like down to the York Haven Dam. So um, there's only going to be a very small number of us fishing that event. And that's anybody who qualified for that event. And, you know, you're, you might be 15 people fishing for a thousand dollars first place, 500 for second and 250 for third. Like, nice. the, you know, there's, there's a really good opportunity to make some money there. And that's also where we'll crown our angler of the year champion. Um, so that's, that's a big event, but it's not big in numbers. And then of course, um, we have the native big bass power hour. Power. which is an MLF it's an MLF format which is really freaking cool. I love the MLF format in terms of inches um because you know I think one year it took like 700 inches to win Jesus that tournament. Christ. It was stupid. <laughs> That's but cool. it was the fall, right? Yeah. So it, you know it was reasonable to go out there <laughs> and you know you might go out and catch a 114 plus inch smallmouth, mm-hmm. right? So the, the biggest struggle you're going to have is finding time to measure all these fish, I, which is, I agree with you. Like I, I really hate it when they tried to compete with bass, just do your own thing. Cause it is fascinating when you go to these fisheries where you could literally catch 300 pounds of bass and you've got to keep right. the pressure up. Like that's a skill. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's cool, you know, but the, the nice thing about the native big bass power hour is it, it kind of, it's like, it's like two tournaments in one really, because you have, you have your, you know, your MLF style format, 
which is your total number of inches of any fish over 14 inches. And then you also have an hourly big bass prize. So every hour, I think, I mean, don't quote me because I don't, I'm it's a thousand dollars. I think it's like a thousand dollars every hour. Yeah. So, I mean, if you say, for instance, like you just go out there and you, you're slinging nothing but like an eight, nine inch swim bait around all day and you catch two 21 inch fish. That's $2,000. Not to mention the fact that one of those 21 inch fish might be the biggest fish caught all day. Mm-hmm. And you also win, I think, a kayak and some more money. So you really might only catch two fish all day because you're throwing a bait that only two fish that you bring it by are going to be able to eat. And those two fish could win you, you know, an upwards of $2,000. I've talked to people that do the big bass bash, like on Smith. Like, it, would your strategy for that, are you just going to lock in the 10-inch glide and hit pay dirt? Or are you going to try to, like... Um, I think I think because I don't, you know, I don't have a whole lot of... I don't have a whole lot to lose in, in either of these tournaments. Because I'm not in the running for Angler of the Year this weekend. I taking Being part of the MAKBF leadership group, I, I really haven't focused a lot on fishing mm-hmm. like i focus i've been more focused on you know helping with the events and getting them situated so i'm not in the running for that um so i think in this first this weekend i'm gonna i'm gonna pin a big bait in my hand and go out there and try to take over the season-long big bass that mickey force is or is currently leading in if that pans out come time for the big bass power hour october 19th I might only go out there with like one or two rods and, and they're both going to have like eight to 10 inch swim baits on them. Oh my God, dude. I mean, speaking I mean, of big bass, I mean, yeah, like seven pounder drops. I mean, eat my words there about the Susky never producing some big ones. Um, it's about time. That's fantastic news. It's that was a North branch fish. Um, you know, it's, I, I don't know. Does that mean less? No. It's like, oh, it's the North branch. No, it's, it's like, not that it means less. I mean, it's still an impressive fish. Um, the angler who caught it, I'm not very fond of. But, um, you know, the the fish itself is impressive. But, uh, you know, whatever. <laughs> so, Congratulations to him. Well, let's say, let's say a, a random person caught it. The fish itself, is that a... If a random person caught it, I'd be like... That is freaking fantastic. Yeah. Is that a unicorn fish? Is that just, or is that something we should see more of? No, it, it's, that's a, that's a rare, rare, rare fish. Like that fish is, that fish is old. Mm. Um, and that's, that fish is just rare. You know, um, it's, it was over 24 inches. It was over seven pounds. And it's really not even the, the prime time key, like fall feed up. Like that fish, in another month could be eight and a half pounds. Yeah. Like, you know, come spawn time, that fish could be a nine pounder. Like you're talking 15 to 20 years old, possibly like that. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Do you think the main stem could ever do that? Oh man. I, I don't know because, so I don't know enough about the North branch and West branch to really, speak intelligently on it. I've fished the North branch a couple of times. I've never fished the West branch. Um, I think that you would probably be a, a better, better luck of finding that quality of fish in the Juniata in the springtime mm. or maybe like, yeah, maybe, maybe late in the fall. And, you know, as those fish get closer to those wintering hole areas, um, you know, after they fed up and just gorged themselves all fall, um, <clears throat> you know, but I, I think that that, that class of fish could be found in the, you know, in the Juniata, I, possibly. I, I just don't know about the, the main stem. There's so many fish, right? The, the, there's so much competition in the main stem for a bunch of 18, 17, 18, 19, 20 inch fish. Like the amount of good fish that we have in this river, yeah. I I feel like it almost in a way makes it where you're never gonna see that giant like like was caught up there. But I mean I'm not a fisheries biologist. I just you look at the amount of big fish that we put put out year after year after year and you know 
who can ever get tired of catching 19, 20 inch smallmouth? I don't know. I don't know who that person is, but they need medical assistance if they get tired of it. But, you know, I just don't know if because of the amount of those type of fish that we have in our section, that if it could ever get to that, that range. I mean, you guys have such a blessed place up there. The one time I went up there this year with my friend's boat and it's, we had the time you didn't invite me. Well, I mean, with that said, you have a boat now. Um, yeah, I I get This is public knowledge. It's not like we're breaking secrets here. So, but yeah, you got into the boat world. Uh, you're no longer a purist. That's insane. Yeah. I'm still a purist. I love my kayak, man. Um, you know, Trey Leach is a very close personal friend and he made, you know, he made a boat that I will for, forever mm. be in love with. Um, I love what that boat's capable of doing. But I bought a boat for a couple different reasons. The main one being my son. I cannot convince my son that kayak fishing is cool. Um, he hates it. He, he despises the, the idea of getting into a kayak and just doesn't want to do it. And I've offered, 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 and he said no, no, no. But then whenever I offer, hey, do you want to go get on the boat with, you know, a, a friend of ours? And he's like all for it. And so far, the time that, you know, I've had the boat, I've offered him to go out on it and he's been all for it. So it could be a change in the in the in the mindset where he actually begins to enjoy fishing with his dad. And if that means that I have to spend money on a on a bass boat, then I'll do that. Cause it's worth that to have that, you know, cause that was something I had as a kid and, you know, I, I cherish, cherish those moments. So it is an interesting mindset. Cause as you guys know, like I, I have both, I mean, I'm not going to mortgage a house for a boat, but if it's paid off, I'll take it. And right. I've had parents come up to me before. Um, cause Jake also sells kayak. He's like, well, you know, my son is eight to nine years old and should I get a kayak and stuff? And it's weird. Cause it's like, do you want, when should they have the independence to do that versus a boat? You and your son can just go out at first. And that is an interesting, I mean, I don't think anyone can answer that, but it is an interesting conversation. Yeah. I mean, for me, it just, <clears throat> you know, the other part of it was that I fell into an incredible deal. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to talk about the origins of, of the deal or the reasons why I got the deal, but... I can um, see the ring light behind you, so I probably know. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, not involving, I don't know, that thing, right? I, who knows? It's not that. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not photographing my butthole to pay for this coat. Um, but, uh, no, there was a gentleman who, you know, it was, it's an emotional story, which is why, and it's not my story. It's his, mm -hmm. so I'm not going to tell it, <clears throat> but, um, you know, he sold the boat cause he wanted it gone. And, um, you know, I met with him a couple different times and looked at the boat and the boat was everything that you could ask for. I mean, it was a 2018 20 foot G3 CCJ and had a 11580 um, Yamaha on the back of it. And the motor had 43 hours. Wow. That's nice. 43 hours. And on top of that, it had a K5 coating on the bottom of it. Mm. So Deal. that's another that's another five grand on top of the boat yeah. price and motor price. So I walked away with a sub thirty thousand dollar payment, uh, you know, price point on a boat that was probably worth thirty five or more. Dude, you can't beat that. Like that's almost be too good to pass up. It was, and that's you know the the deal. Like <laughs> I came home and I was like, "Hello, wife." <sighs> I have to have a talk. She's like, what did you do? I'm like, nothing. It's what yeah, I want to do. <laughs> it's, what I'm, it's what I'm getting ready to ask you for. Um, so yeah, I've been doing a lot of laundry. So cooking a lot of dinners. Well, had, as a kayak purist, I have personally seen some changes, you know, exact, like I'm getting higher speed reels because I kept, I had the shittiest event two weekends ago because my reels are too slow that was one difference i Who, saw go huh? who'd you learn that from who'd you learn that from yeah you <laughs> um did you learn anything different about boat control versus a boat kayak fishing set of, like little things 
no, I'm I'm ridiculous because I'm fishing out of my boat like I'm fishing out of my kayak. I'm still fishing upstream. I'm on the trolling motor on you know like on speed like five or six or seven, and I'm still going upstream. I'm not floating. Um, I, I'm not going to change. I'm not going to change just to. I, I feel like what you can do out of a kayak if you're set up correctly what you can do out of a kayak will work in a boat. I feel like if you're set up for boat fishing and you try to transfer it to a kayak, yes. it doesn't work as good. Nope. It doesn't. So I'm still going to run braid on, on, on almost all of my main lines. Um, I have a fantastic partnership and deal with Finn's braid who make, they make braid that doesn't fade. It's black. It's called Finn's infinity. And I have a bunch of large bulk spools of it that I just have no desire to change that because I'm still going to get deep hook sets. I'm going to have zero stretch whenever these fish try to jump. And if they grab the bait and run down river at me, then I'm still going to be able to catch up to them and not have all that stretch whenever I get hook sets. That's still going to help in the boat. In the kayak, it's a necessity. Mm -hmm. In the boat, it's still going to work. So I'm not going to change. Yeah, because, like, I mean, the biggest thing I saw is, like, it's easier to play fish in a boat than a kayak because you can move around it, where that's right. the hardest change for me now is you have no movement, pretty much. And you have to think, this is, again, like, if you guys are listening, just having a GoPro just to watch film on yourself helps because I didn't realize all the fishermen, son of a bitch, my, my torpedo was engaged the whole time. And I was making a cast, and I didn't realize, like, there was no way in hell I was catching up to a couple of those bites I was getting. Yeah. It's just little stupid things like that when it comes to your fish hookup ratio that it, it is people it's, that have a boat. They don't understand. Like it's different when you make the transition. Yeah. It's funny. Like that you say that I had a, I had a few haters maybe last year on some of the social media posts that I was making at like a TikTok and an Instagram reel. And I was cruising. Like I'm going probably, you know, two and a half miles an hour up river into current. It's that's coming at me at a pretty good clip. And like, I'm, I'm just burning a whopper plopper, but whenever I'm reeling, I'm like, you know, like it, it looks ridiculous. Like it's in fast, like it's in fast forward. I wasn't in fast forward. That's just how fast I was reeling. And I had a fish literally come from like eight feet off the bank and come out and just try to destroy a whopper plopper. And I hooked up with it for a brief period of time. And then it got off. The amount of hate comments that came after that. Oh, you're going too fast. Why would you be reeling that fast? What could you possibly be going that fast for? And like most of them I, I ignored. But if you catch me at the wrong minute and I'm like, you know what? No, I'm not. I'm not going to ignore you just because I'm going to have fun with this. But like that's how our fish are, dude. Mm -hmm. our, our fish most of the year, there is no such thing as too fast. There's no such thing as as you know, the, of, of not presenting it in a fast enough way for them. Um, and, you know, to combat that, like you said, about higher speed reels, braid, no stretch, um, those things are very important on a river system like ours, especially when you're fishing out of a kayak. Um, <clears throat> you can, and you can still get away with it when you're doing it from a boat. I mean, there's been numerous times I've been on other people's boats and, I haven't changed my gear setups just to because I'm going out on the boat. It still works. Uh, knock on wood. Knock, I'm going to knock on wood right now. Let me find some wood. Since I've had the boat, I have not lost a single fish. Hmm. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, so, I wouldn't have said that before these two tournaments, but, you know, that's good for you. That's the boat. It's the boat. It's. I mean, the kayak. I'm not going to lose fish. <laughs> I told, what was it? The one post you made, and I said I don't lose fish. Oh, the Diddy one. That one went viral. My God. <laughs> oh my goodness. I saw someone else like just took real magic and put Diddy sauce on there. I was like, that's awesome. Oh, that's that's funny as hell. Why couldn't that's people? I, I would use Diddy sauce if someone came out with a fishing product like that. That's a hilarious joke. Uh, I wonder how much. I mean, could you get in any trademark trouble for that? I I don't know. You just tell them that you know would, stuff, and they'll leave you. I alone. would call it Diddy. I would call it Diddy's juice. Yeah, like 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 what real snot or like just for the bait scent, like Diddy's juice. Oh, bait scent would Diddy's, be good. Diddy's juice, yeah. 
That'd be musty. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, Justin Bieber. We know what happened. Yeah. Sorry, Usher. Sorry, <laughs> bunch of people. Oh, God. We can laugh about it now. Uh, I don't think we can. I don't. I, the more and more keeps coming out and out and out about that whole thing. And it's just, it gets more disgusting each time some a news flash comes across it does but like i mean for part of it is a lot of these people sold their soul for it to get famous so it's like you know what it, it and again yeah. it's it's funny but the amount of people that said they would do that would, would go into diddy's house so they never lost a fish again it's like guys i didn't say you'd be a pro i just said you wouldn't lose a fish again <laughs> like <laughs> you gotta be better at contract negotiation here oh my i i i think I don't know. I'm trying to think what it would take for me to get to go to a Diddy party. It's not going to involve fishing. I can promise you that. Well, you already did midget wrestling. So was it like one step removed? (laughs) They were, they weren't oiled up. Ah, okay. Like the image. I don't know. (laughs) Listen, so the whole, so the, the, we're going to call it micro wrestling. So that way your (laughs) podcast doesn't get canceled. Um, but the micro wrestling, I got to tell this story because it's not like I'm just infatuated with LPs, <laughs> but, um, so I have a coworker who is a little an incredibly close friend. He is, I mean, he's, you know, we're, we work in law enforcement, right? So we, we, we could be each other's last person that we're going to see if it's the last breath that we're going to take, right? That's how close we are. He and I are like, we're, we're, we're brothers, and he is very dark skin African American, and I'm obviously like borderline ginger. So, but we're still brothers, right? So he <laughs> he had my entire Instagram algorithm fucked. There's no other way to put it <laughs> outside of that because he would send me LPs all the time, like boop boop. So I'm like naturally, like I get him, I click on him, I'm like, uh. Look, it's a, it's another LP. It's another LP doing something silly. And some of them were comical. But, like, I got, I broke it down. And I'm like, dude, I'm like, do you, like, are, are you in love with, with LPs? Like, what's going on? He's like, they're just so awesome. Like, and it, when he would talk about them, he would light up. That's got to be an right? awkward car conversation while you're sitting doing traffic tickets. <laughs> so, so he would, he would light up whenever we talk about it. Or when he would send one or see one, you look at him at his phone. And he's like, e-, you know, he's cheesing. I'm like, all right. So I saw micro wrestling was coming to Harrisburg and I'm like there, I can't not do this. So I went and dropped the money and bought three tickets, me, him and my neighbor. Um, we took my neighbor, Chris, um, because he, I felt like Chris would fit in well with the group. Is that good? Uh, <laughs> and, and dude, like, I, the, the face. <laughs> oh my! I'll have to send you. A, if I send you a photo right now, can you green screen it? I I will put it in post production. <laughs> okay. Okay. Because I'm gonna send it to you, dude. Like the face that he made at this at this was just it. It was incredible. It was worth the money that I spent. <laughs> Oh, uh, that was that was an interesting discovery. Seeing that you at that thing and and what you were posting from it, uh, it looked like fun though, dude. I took over five hundred photos at that event, like over five hundred photos at that event. Look at this man's face. <laughs> dude, it was it was fantastic. Like, oh, it was great. Oh my god. Hey, we had a good time though. I almost got kicked out for joining in. They, well, no, they were selling raffle tickets, right? And there was a, 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 you know, an LP walking around selling the raffle tickets. And I asked the question. I'm like, I'm like, do you guys do the fifty fifty? Because they did it. They were doing it for like the wounded warriors and stuff. And I'm like, do you guys do the fifty fifties of like for wounded warriors at, at all the midget wrestling events? And he's like, you can't say that. And I was like, what? He's like, you can't say that. I'm like, say what? And he's like, midget. I'm like, you fucking said it. He's like, well, I can say it. And I'm like, I'm going to say it. <laughs> like, he got me. Like, I think he was joking, but he visibly got angry or at least pretended to be angry about it. And I was like, I don't give a shit. Throw me out, bro. Like, I'll grab two beers on the way out and Stone Cold Steve Austin this shit. 
that would be a great headline for the Mid Atlantic Kayak <laughs> Series. It's like he, head oh. or one of the heads of state uh, in allegations at midget wrestling. Oh my god, that that is a political headline. I don't think it's going to make the the news. <laughs> Not with everything else that's going on right now. I mean, the fishing in my area, man, a lot of places are just trashed. Some places are are doing okay. It's just did, well, did you see up here? We had that up in uh, Sealands Grove. There was a big sewer main that broke. Really? Dumping, yeah, it was dumping like thousands and thousands of gallons of raw sewage into the into the river through Penn's Creek. Mm. But I, I they got it fixed, as far as I know. I don't know what if there's a, if there's been any fish kills upriver because I haven't fished north of I haven't fished north of Harrisburg in a month or so. Um. But, yeah, I know that there was a huge sewer main break that they had up there, and and it dumped a lot of raw sewage into the river. I hear they're bringing the back Three Mile Island, too, right? Yeah. Um, apparently, there's some Microsoft AI. I don't know. I, I don't know exactly what it's powering, but it's going to power something from Microsoft. Mm-hmm. So Three Mile Island is going to come back online, which is it's great for the local economy. Um, I would have loved to have seen Three Mile Island come back online completely for power source for all of us. Yeah, because I'm, you know, I'm tired of paying outrageous electric bills, and well, I don't pay them anymore because I put solar panels on my roof. But um, yeah, I'm I was about sick and tired of paying six hundred dollars month over the winter for electric will, will that change the current flows at all when that thing gets back online about where it intakes and dumps out the water i don't think so there might be there might be some intakes and in, in outflows that become productive again but it doesn't it doesn't redistribute enough current <sighs> to make okay. a huge difference and and the other thing too is not a lot of people don't understand where three mile island actually is it's in a pulled up section of the Susquehanna River that's more lake like. Um, so there there is current there, but there's not as much current as as there is, you know, a couple ledges north. Um, that place will pop in the wintertime, though, I bet. Mm, yeah. Well, they're going to have to have regulations, though. Right. Just like some of the other power plants on the river. Um, some of the power plants on the river, like you can't go dumping. You can't go dumping. 70 degree water into a 30 degree river yeah. right because if you do you're gonna have fish kills so they have to i believe they have to regulate that water temperature to a certain range um before they redistribute it into the river hmm. that's interesting i'm gonna have to definitely get somebody on to talk about that um you know ted ted evangelies or something like that is the middle susquehanna river keeper he would be an excellent person to have on. I could get you his contact. I have it in my phone. Yes, because I really want to get a riverkeeper on to talk about that because I haven't heard back from the bio, like uh, the your DWR department to talk about some of the regulations and stuff. Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania doing. Fish and Boat Commission. Yeah. So here's what you do. Here's how you get a hold of Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. Oh, Jesus. Just call them up and tell them you want to talk about trout stockings and how trout are performing in like the yellow breaches. And so on and so forth. Get them to agree to the podcast. And then when they come on, ask them about bass. Because I, I, they have, again, I agree with that. Because they have this whole thing about being completely trout leaning. But then also the Conway and Go Dam has come up. You know, again, I'm on the Maryland Black Bass Board. And we were even talking about like the sediment issue potentially with the dam. And, and what is being done about that. So that's an ongoing thing that's been going on for years. Where Constellation who owns the dam, I believe it's Constellation. They own the dam and, you know, they don't feel that the burden should be on them. So they're looking to the state for some money. Maryland's like, why the hell should it be our fault? Why should we have to clean it? Mm -hmm. We got like six miles of the Susquehanna River above the Conowingo Dam. And then there's hundreds and hundreds of miles through Pennsylvania and New York. Why should Maryland have to pay that bill? And Maryland's right. Like Mm -hmm. Maryland is right. They shouldn't have to, you know, front that bill. Constellation should front the majority of it because they're the ones making money off of it. However, if we make Constellation pay the majority of it, all of us who receive power 
from that dam or the people in the area that receive power from that dam are then going to in turn feel the burden of that. So how do you, you know, how do you fix that problem? I I hate government, but with that said, it's probably going to have to be a federal thing if it becomes an ecological disaster <clears throat> issue. Have have you know if it's a federal thing, you may as well just blow the dam up. I know. Yeah. I'm not saying that anyone should go do that. <laughs> not promoting violence. Yeah. All I'm saying is that if you're going to rely on the federal government, um, at least under the current regime, to to do anything to benefit the people, then I feel like maybe you're probably wishing in a well that's dry. I just wish they would actually – maybe they have already, like given an estimate how much this is going to cost. I, I've talked to people about the grass issue on Gunnersville. I said, like, well, how much to like – put the generators in that can actually cut up the grass. So it's not an issue. No idea how much it costs, but it's expensive. So like, well, that's not even a starting point. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, man. I don't know much about the, about the Connell Wingo yeah. uh, outside of what I just talked about. Um, I, I do think that I read a news article maybe last year or the year before where they were talking about it, about this exact issue. Um, but it's not something like this isn't new news. This is something that's going to be an ongoing thing. And, 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 and I understand everybody's party, everyone's part in it. You know, Maryland should not have to front the bill for all of Pennsylvania and New York's sediment. You know, when you look at the amount of trash that gets collected down yeah. there, you look at the amount of, you know, driftwood that's get, that gets collected down there. Um, you know, people, people just not taking care of the ecosystem in its entirety has created this problem. But... <clears throat> who's who's to fix it it's an interstate problem it's new york it's pennsylvania it's maryland mm -hmm. so collectively why can't the three come together with constellation to say let's do something about it but, it's yeah. yeah yeah it's depressing it really is yeah because there's there's so many great fisheries up and down this river system um you know people sleep on certain sections of this river and say, oh, well, you know, this section's not good or the North Branch isn't great because it's a bunch of small fish. However, a seven pounder just got caught there. Um, the West Branch isn't great because it's so clear and they're so hard to catch, but every tournament gets one out of the West Branch up there. You know, you look anywhere between Sunbury and Harrisburg and you can't pick a bad stretch of water. And then below Harrisburg, you got... You know, you had some flathead issues, but after the 2018 floods, all that started to regulate and those fish are coming back and they're all giant. You know, I know of people catching 21 inch fish in Marietta, which, you know, just hasn't been like it, this. The whole river system is good. We just had a, a tournament on the Conowingo this year that a 21 and three quarter inch smallmouth was caught on the Conowingo. That place is every, really cool. Every section of this river has quality fishing. Is Harrisburg every, slept on? Harrisburg? Yeah, because it because it's there's so many places to launch there. It's so known. It's that, that's a that's a little bit of a far fetched statement. There's compared to what Harrisburg is, there's not a lot of places to launch. There's two. There's two launches in Harrisburg. There's one on City Island. And then there's one that is in the upper end of the pool at the West Fairview boat ramp. Um, Harrisburg is not slept on probably because of my YouTube channel. I think my YouTube channel has exposed <clears throat> most of some of the best places to fish in Harrisburg. Um, but you still have an accessibility aspect, right? So, People that are on the bank are stuck to the bank, yeah. right? People in the boats, um, a lot of times they don't go to Harrisburg in the summertime just because of the pleasure boat traffic. Ooh, because point. that's the reason why Dock Street Dam exists. Um, Dock Street Dam exists that way that the island could be lucrative for the city. That way businesses could benefit and profit from having the boat traffic. Um you know, that's that's one of the main reasons why Dock Street Dam exists is to create a recreational environment for the city of Harrisburg on that section of the river. If Dock Street Dam didn't exist, Harrisburg would be as low as any other place on the river. 
and you would you know you would be able to walk across it in most places because Dock Street Dam exists. It exists. It, that's not the case, but um, I don't think it's slept on. People know. People know about it. I just think that it gets really, really busy, and that's why people tend to avoid it. It makes a lot of logical sense because I was just even thinking from um, <clears throat> anyone that wanted to go hunt there, so to speak. You look at a map; it's like, well, clearly everyone drives over top this portion, and then you know Salisbury wins, the West Branch wins. They're all a little bit more like you have to think a little bit trickier. And I think a lot of times as anglers, we try to outthink the room and be really crafty when we don't have to. I think in a river system, you just need to think. You need to outthink the water. Right. Oh Jesus! The fish, are, the fish, are, the fish are going to be present where they're supposed to be, but you, as an angler, need to put put your bait in the right place based on how the current is going to affect it. Mm -hmm. I think that's where most people struggle on a river. That's deep. Yeah, it's pretty deep. You spend way too much time with Jeff. No, no, I have not actually. <laughs> man, I have not gotten to fish with my buddy Jeff since march is he fishing tournaments now no no he's helping out a friend ah gotcha okay yeah, yeah. i saw that one video that dropped that like i blank lost money it's like i didn't think that no him. so there there was a new series that i'm not going to talk about because i don't care to promote it but a new national series came out and um jeff is close with the person who came up with the idea um, and you know, I can't choose my buddy's friends. I can only be friends with my buddy. So, um, but you know, he, uh, he goes and participates in that to help further his bit, you know, his, his endeavor. And I respect that, but, um, yeah, that's all I'll say. On it. Are you ever going to, I know we keep talking about this, but I keep trying to push you this way. Just like the guy that get, try to get you to do drugs, do the national tours ever again. Uh, I don't want to. You really never want to again? I don't have any desire to. That's you going to ask me why? No, it's like, I get it. It's just you st you're in that good prime part of your life right now where you can still crack them. But I guess you've already done everything that you've wanted to. You've already won at the big stage, so it's nothing left to prove. Well, no, you, there's always something to prove to somebody. Um, I personally don't operate in the sense of having anything to prove. Um, I think I'm the best fisherman in the room, in any room that I walk into. And some might say that that's an ego. Some might say that that's, you know, some might even think it's sarcasm. It's not like I literally will, any room I walk into, I look at myself as the best fisherman. If we're in a competitive, a competitive, competitive environment, right? If we're just having fun and shit like that, I'm not looking at it that way. Like I just want to go out and have fun because fishing is fun, mm -hmm. but in a competitive environment, that's my mindset. Um, so I don't have anything to prove to anybody. However, there's some things that have happened on the national scene on the national tournament trails that have left a bad taste in my mouth. And I just going to choose not to do them anymore. Mm. Unless maybe, if one comes to my backyard and it takes me until the very last day to sign up because I'm on the fence and finally people are like, dude, if you don't sign up, you're stupid because you know, you're going to cash a check. And, and then I do it reluctantly and go out and not have a good time with it. Then that, then that might happen like this year. Yeah, I mean, you know, years go up and down. I mean, you've had good years. You've had bad years. Like that stuff happens. <clears throat> it's fishing. I mean, 2020, 2020 was amazing, right? Um, I I had won MAKBF Angler of the Year in 2019 and jumped into 2020 and the very first national tournament trail that I participated in that year. I went down to the Lake Seminole Hobie BOS and won. Where do you go from there? What do you... It is. It's weird, though, right? Like, is it better to get fame early in life or late? Like, I've always like heard that philosophical question. If it's late, you get to enjoy it and you understand it versus if it's the first thing in your life. Like, I don't ever want to be famous. I don't ever want to be famous. But I think what you're referring to is to have success early. Yeah, that's the quote. Um, 
No, I will tell you that it sucked. Mentally, it sucked. And mm-hmm. I think that's one of the things that kind of turned me initially off to the national tournament trails. I went and won in 2020 at Hobie BOS, right? At, at Lake Seminole. The very next event that I fished, I, in my mind, was expecting myself to win. I go into almost every event thinking to myself, how am I going to win? What do I have to do to win? But I was going into the next event expecting myself to win. And I put so much unnecessary pressure on myself because of the previous success that I had. And I quickly got my dick stomped in. So, no, it's a it's a hard lesson to learn Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, not everybody is Ewing minor. Not everybody is is as good as some of these guys are where they can go out and just have so much knowledge on so many different varieties of fisheries. Um, you know, I'm a, in really, in, I'm a one trick pony. Like if you give me current, I do well. If you put me on a landlocked body of water, that's still, I suck. Well, and again, I think to give yourself more credit from the minor brothers here, when you get to fish all these same places over a career from high school all the way here, it gives you a hell of advantage. Even if you sucked, if you suck at a place for five years, eventually you're going to crack the code. And I know both brothers fished college, you know, one fished the opens and stuff. I had them both on my show a couple of times. That's a hell of an advantage to have yeah. just seeing those fisheries again and again and again. And right. I, I, I don't know. Like that's the problem is if you really want to make a, a go at this, the, at any kind of national tour, boat or kayak, assume the first year is going to suck, but it's just to get your lumps of going to these places because you're going to see them all the time. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's certainly a huge advantage. It's a huge advantage to have, you know, that ability to travel as well. Yeah. To have oh, that yeah. ability to take off time, time off. And, you know, I don't have, I don't have the ability to take off a week and a half for every tournament that I want to go to, because that's what it really boils down to is a week and a half. You have a day or two of travel, depending on where you're going on both ends. And then you have maybe two to three days worth of pre fishing. And then you have two days of tournament, right? So in order to truly do it, you need to take about a week to a week and a half off of work for every event that you attend. I can't do that. I can't do that because otherwise I won't be able to pay my mortgage. Right? So, there's certainly an advantage to not, and I, I don't want to make it seem like they don't have any responsibilities, but being young That's a big and thing. being, being the time where they, you know, where they don't have a mortgage, they don't have a wife and a family and, and dogs to, you know, to pay for. Um, they don't have horses to pay for. Um, you know, like that's a huge advantage of being able to have that luxury of time. And you yeah. see that with the some of the biggest names in the sport. If you look and you look at like Christine, right? Christine has that luxury because fishing is her job, mm-hmm. right? She can do everything that she needs to do to make her living while on the road, while traveling to these places. And then traveling to these places and fishing is part of her job, right? The same could be said for Jody Queen. The same could be said for Russ Snyders. The same could be said for a variety of other names in the sport that are, that are very well known in, in kayak fishing. These people are doing it full time. Some of them are doing it as a retirement job, such as like Jody Queen. But, you know, they're doing it full time. This is their job. So there's a huge, huge advantage for those people. Um, and naturally, because of that, and I'm not saying because of the advantage that they're, that they're there, what got them there to give them that advantage is their skill set. And then by, by default, their skill set has produced an advantage for them over top of everybody else. I would say two <laughs> things can be true at the same time. They have the skill set to be there, but then also they have these other factors that give them the time to improve the skill set. Because a great example is like the college fishing scene. You could be a kid 
and you just get uh, you go to a college university that has a fishing team and for four years you get to travel all over the place basically for almost free and you get to right. see those places you automatically have a bigger advantage over a guy that worked a nine to five that never got to do that because they have a family and that's just right. it's just a fact so yeah. it, it is and again i know you, you say to people that were a little bit older in life but like when you see these young kids coming in that's the big advantage they've had four years five years six years just seeing these places so it's not new to them I think one of the biggest takeaways that from, you know, and I don't consider myself an OG of the sport just yet um, because there's still, the, you know, kayak fishing started maybe five, six, seven years before I even got into it. Right. Um, now I've been doing it for the, almost the last, the last decade, really. I'm getting there. Right. Some of those old head players that used to be huge and huge names in the sport that aren't there anymore they're filtering their way out as they just stop and maybe have transitioned into something else. So maybe I'm close to being an OG of the sport. But one thing that I can say about, you know, that aspect is that if anything that I've done, if anything, any groundwork that I've laid, whether it's been on a national series or whether it's been at a local level, if anything that I have done has been able to further the, kayak fishing into something where it gets young kids outside of a video game and puts them in a boat or a kayak and mm -hmm. teaches them the appreciation and the love for the outdoors that I have. If anything I have done creates that avenue for them, I, I consider that a huge success. And whether I fish tournaments ever again, that's a huge success because I can say that something that – Maybe I facilitated as being part of MAKBF leadership group. Maybe maybe that one thing that appealed to that kid, or maybe we brought a tournament trail to that kid's backyard and he's seen it. And man, I want to do that. Now he's doing it. What other, what, I mean, how, how else do you measure success? That's success. So yeah. I'm happy with that. And you've done a great job. I mean, like you've you really, I mean, I feel like we're writing your goddamn obituary right now. This is depressing right now, but it's like, you know, he was a great man, it, but, um, <laughs> it's not, well, and that's the other thing too. So I'm speaking and I'm speaking for my, for myself, but I'm not doing this alone either. MAKBF is comprised of a group of men who have come together and ran for the last decade, a, an incredible tournament trail. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot of big names, people that on the local scene that have been a part of that. I'm not taking credit for it at all. I'm just looking at it from my own perspective saying that, you know, if something that I've done creates a, an avenue for a kid to get into the sport, then I've done my job as a, as an outdoorsman and I've done my job as a, as a human because I've facilitated somebody else to see and appreciate the things that I see and appreciate. And, and I think you guys have done a great job in kayaking in general. Cause again, like, you know, having my hands in, in so many pies right now, kayaking, especially in Northern Virginia area, you know, you know, Ashburn, Cashburn, where you can't really, where are you going to put a 21 foot Skeeter? You, you have no room yeah. with houses on top of each other, but there's so many people I see just around your group in VKVA that if they didn't have kayaking, they wouldn't be into fishing. And it comes back to the point that as we get further into this freaking recession, and it costs three hundred dollars to fill up a boat. I think these regional groups, like what you guys have here with your great payouts, why would you want to go travel for bass or Hobie? Like, there's no need to. And that's yeah. that's one thing about the MAKBF that really I I made it I made it a goal whenever I came in. A goal of my own was to make do something to make our tournament series so lucrative and so appealing that somebody who lives in Pennsylvania, Maryland, Delaware, New Jersey, Virginia chooses to come fish with us before they choose to drive to Alabama to fish or drive mm -hmm. to Texas to fish. And I'm not trying to make them make a decision. I look at it as, okay, they made a decision to fish with us because our tournament series is what it is. That's awesome. That's amazing. And if we can do that by partnering with, you know, whether it be the Juniata River Valley or Hartford County Tourism or Charles County Tourism, 
or any of these other tourism bureaus that we're partnering with, or even just sponsors. Like we partnered with you this year. You, you sponsored one of our events this year. Um, that's a huge thing. Like, because it's, we, you, in a, in a way, you're fishing the DMV podcast, made it possible for someone to say, I'm going to go fish that series because look, look at what they're paying out to their people that win. And that's the things like payouts are a sign of respect. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, one of the, I'm one of the co-hosts for the BassCast radio. And the thing that we talk about is like the BFLs. It's not the forward facing center. It's the problem. It's the payouts suck. Right. It's like, you're going to pay me 200 bucks and I have to go take a guy out fishing. Like, screw yeah. that. I'm not doing it. And as this becomes more like if you have these tournament organizations that are willing like yours or, or, or and there's more out there, too, that are like this, but that will willing to respect the anglers and give them good payouts, they will come. They will. And that that's one of the other things, too. Like our tournament series is not for profit for anyone The the, the series doesn't profit. The, the members of the leadership group, group don't profit. Um, we don't get paid for our time. We don't get anything for our time. We, we volunteer our time to make the series what it is, but the sponsors make the payouts what they are because we also don't want to charge the angler a huge sum of money to come fish with us. So there's a, there's a, there's a median somewhere that we all have to mm. like meet at. The sponsors meet with us, with our leadership. The sponsors meet with us, and the the anglers meet with their with their entry fee to somehow create this balance that has perfectly worked out this year. This year has worked out perfectly. We have had our highest attendance. We've paid out more money than we've ever paid out, and we've had you know some of the greatest successes that the series has ever had, and. Part of that was partnering with these with these sponsors, people that we haven't done this with before. Everyone's going to endemic sponsors and saying, hey, you know, can you give us this or can you give us that? And, and most of the sponsors are like, yeah, we'll absolutely give you product. Product is great. Product is fantastic. I love having prizes to give away to people. That is huge. But most people who are already doing this already have what they need yeah and and i think what makes it better what draws them in is that number that money value and i think the other hard part to see is the the constriction of the fishing industry and the fishing culture where i know a lot of people not not all of course not all but there are a lot of people that run these these places for the department of tourism and for business development they don't fish their name is debbie they drink wine and they're on Instagram and they think like, you want me to give your money to do fishing? Ew. And that's weird because the more of these people that are, are in these, these, these halls of power, the harder it is to get money from them because they just don't think this is what generates traffic. But if you go back 10 years ago, that wasn't the case. There was a lot more open mindedness to the fishing culture, I think, than you have nowadays. Uh, I don't know. And, and I guess it's just me being pessimistic because I've seen both sides of this thing being on the board and stuff and seeing. That, some- yeah, I, I haven't really seen that both sides of it. I've yeah. been an angler for most of my time. And then, you know, this year, my task on the on the leadership group was hardly anything dealing with anglers. Most of my dealings this year has been all with sponsors. So you get more charm than me, though. So I could see you serenading. All well, the it's over not. The phone. No, I, 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 would not, <laughs> I would not call it charm at all let me readjust my butt's falling asleep um <laughs> so one one thing that i that i tried to do this year and i don't want to give away too much because we do have competitors we have competitive mm. series in this in this region like i tried to show the the sponsors that we that we targeted how i could best benefit them and you know, they, many of them had no idea what kayak fishing was, kayak bass fishing. Um, every sponsor that, you know, was not part of the industry, fishing industry, had no idea what the hell we were talking about whenever I started talking to them. But I was able to explain it in a non-condescending way, in a, in, in a, in, in a way that it showed how we could benefit their region how we could benefit their business to show up there. 
And fortunately enough, fortunately enough, the anglers of the series did not let me down and they showed up. Mm -hmm. Um, Can I say something that's hard for you though? That's hard for you because I know it's MVKBA. When you have a kayak thing where there's no like a way in a central place to tell everyone for prizes, by the way, you, you please show up like to the central. That, that's hard to do. That's like hurting right. cats sometimes. Well, and, and one of the biggest, I think one of the biggest struggles we had this year was the Potomac because the Potomac is a vast fishery, oh, God, right? Yeah. From the yeah. 495 bridge to the 301 bridge, it's huge. It's mm-hmm. huge, right? And Sometimes if you are fishing on the Virginia side and we have the awards on the Maryland side, you might have an hour and a half drive at the end of your day of fishing just to show up at awards. So we really, really had to try to get tricky and, and unique with the things that we yeah. were you know, coming up with and to make it lucrative for the anglers to even show up. Um, you know, but it, it worked, it worked well and it was successful and, and I'm I am super happy. Um, Josh Evans laid the groundwork this year. Um, he dealt with Charles County Visitors Bureau majority of of everything. Um, you know he he really set us up well for future you know future successes with them and, and partnerships with them. You know we had an excellent uh, an excellent showing with the Juniata River Valley. I think if we would have had our tournament in April, if the floods wouldn't have canceled us, I really think that event would have been like 80 people. There were so many people that wanted to come to that event. Um, we ended up having to push it till after the, the spawn closure in Pennsylvania, which was mid to late June. And we still had like 50 plus people, I think is, I think the number was over 50. That's huge. That's huge mm-hmm. for a small community. Right. When 50 anglers show up and eat and 50, you know, out of those 50, 25 are showing up and buying hotels and people are coming and buying gas and they're buying, you know, water, they're buying food, they're buying these things. They're also patronizing the areas, you know, in the, the nightlife, if you will. They're going out and doing things that um, that are available and just promoting for them, too, because they don't have anybody promoting for them outside of them. So, you know, doing that promotion for like the JRV in Harford County, Harford County out isn't, isn't a huge tourism place. Um, but when we talk about bringing a tournament series there, they were excited to have us. They wanted to know about it. They wanted to know what we were. And, you know, I think that there's more expansion to make there. I think there's other partnerships to make with other communities that we can also benefit and equally benefit. So I'm excited about the future. And I just hope that the groundwork that we laid is, you know, somehow helps this continue on. Are you guys ever thinking about expanding like down, like further South or further North? I mean, you're mid Atlantic. So in 2022, we attempted, we attempted when, when, so the MAKBF was a standalone series prior to 2022. And it was its own thing, but there were other competitors in the region. And one of those competitors was the Delaware, um, Delaware KBFS, something, uh, I forget what, something right. Um, but the leadership amongst the two groups were close and we worked together. And what we realized is that we were double tap in the same region. And like, there was one, one year, where we had events like back to back weekends and we're thinking to ourselves, how does this benefit the angler, right? How does it benefit the angler to have an event on the Conowingo one weekend and the next weekend have an event on the Conowingo with a different series? It doesn't benefit the angler because the angler wants to fish both. The angler wants to support both series. So we thought to ourselves, if we combine the two series, you know, roll the DPS KBFS into MAKBF because we're also drawing from the same sponsor base. So now we're asking our sponsors for more to give us both, both entities, more money. Hmm. And, you know, rather than do our sponsors dirty like that, why not just combine our effort? Right. So we, we rolled DPS KBFS into MAKBF. The reason we did that is because MAKBF had a longer standing. It was a longer standing club. Um, and, 
and we tried in 2022. We I think we put an event on the Rappahannock. Um, we put an event on the Delaware River. Oof. We put events in. Well, we we went to the upper stretches of the Delaware oh. River that were primarily smallmouth. Um, but we tried. What we saw was that people didn't want to do it. We almost we almost tried to outgrow ourselves too mm. much in the first year. Um, would I like to see an expansion? Yes, I would love to see an expansion, but I would love to see an expansion that doesn't create enemies, right? So I don't want to go down into NVKBA territory and have an event and then be like, yo, what are you doing in our backyard? Mm -hmm. I would like to partner with them, right? Because that's how we're going to get max participation. Partnering with every other local trail, every other series, um, and having that. So like if we go to Delaware, I don't want to go stepping on NJKBF. I, you know, I want to, I want to talk to NJKBF and say, Hey, we want to have an event on the Delaware river. Let's combine, let's work together. We bring our group, you bring you, you bring your group. And now all of a sudden we have 50 to 75 anglers competing for this event. That's ultimately what we, what we want to do. I just think we tried to do it a little too early. I'm not ruling it out. It, it works on the Potomac. I feel like you guys kind of do that on the Potomac. We like, do, big. but we've been doing that on the Potomac for a number of years. Um, and then the other aspect, too, is now there's there's even more trails than just yeah. MAKBF and NVKBA. Um, there's there's a new trail that we partnered with this year, the Chesapeake Real Masters. Um, they're, they're a cool, unique club, and they have, you know, they primarily only fish tidal water. Right. So they alternate back and forth between the upper bay and the Potomac. Um, we partnered with them for a couple events. Um, we partnered with the Jackson kayak trail, I think, for the Conowingo, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, we've partnered with them. So we're we're up to partnering with everybody. And going as far as as our membership is willing to go. But I think in 2022, we just tried to do it a little too quick. Mm -hmm. That was our first year where after we combined and I think some of the folks that were that were diehard DPS KBFS guys, they really enjoyed fishing the Delaware ponds in the local Delmarva region. And now we were expanding out way outside of that region. We lost some of those folks. Um, we would love to have them back, but with the same same thing said, we can't just fish Delmarva ponds when we're this group, right? When yeah. we're this size of the group that we bring, could you imagine putting 50 anglers on, on a Delaware pond? Like it yeah. would be very difficult, right? So we have to kind of expand. And unfortunately, because of that expansion, we lost some of our core membership base. So I think once we gain that core membership base back and, and continue to put out a quality lucrative product, I think the expansion outside of the regions where we are right, right now, I think will be will will work and be effective. But it's just not in the cards. Probably not even next year. Um, this year was a great trial run. It was a great it was a great season. It was a record breaking season. But we need to have like three record breaking seasons before we can look and say, okay, let's take the MAKBF name and say. We're going to show up in Northern Virginia and hope that NVKBA will partner with us. But MAKBF is bringing 50 anglers ourselves, mm -hmm. right? That's what we want. And to get 50 people to want to travel, you know, four to six hours away from their home, it's going to take, it's going to take some, it's going to take money is what it's going to take. How big is too big with a boat tournament? You, you don't have much of this issue because it self-contains because of weigh-ins, but with kayaking where you can launch from anywhere, I think the Bassmaster event in the Susky had over 200, 300 competitors. Like, the Bassmaster event on the Susquehanna was too many. Okay. 225 people on the stretch of the river because here's the thing. Bassmaster on the Susky, they had to go way north to get the sponsorship money, right? So they go way north and they get the sponsorship money from the community that will give it. Hershey and Harrisburg Visitors Bureau will never give us money. They're never going to do it because they're combined. If it was just Harrisburg, yeah, they would probably give us money. But Harrisburg, Hershey combined, Hershey will never give us money to come to the region because Hershey doesn't benefit from it. On top of that, 
two to three times a week, Hershey has 10 to 20,000 people here for concerts. They don't care if two, if, if a hundred or more kayakers come to this area, they don't care. But so like we, that outside of it, just capacity for the river is 200 or 300 competitors at once too so, many. So I, yeah, let me get back to that on topic with that. Um, 225 would be great if all of the river was equal. Okay. Right. The West branch and North branch, in my opinion, and this might be an ignorant opinion because I don't know, but the West branch and North branch are not equal to the main stem. The main stem has more big fish, in my opinion, than those two river systems have. So what ends up happening is when you have an event come here and 225 people come here, 200 people end up fishing the main stem. When you decrease the amount on the main stem from Sunbury to Duncannon, you you now take out like 30 miles of river from what we normally have, which is like Sunbury to Goldsboro, mm. right? So now you've decreased the amount of river and you've put more people on it. 225, way too many. If, gotcha. if the stretch is going to be from, you know, way up north to Duncannon, 225 is too many because 200 of those people are between Duncannon and, and Sunbury. Wow. And then you got, you know, 40, 50 miles of each west and north branch that are basically untouched because people aren't fishing it because the quality is not there. The numbers of quality is not there. Sure, you might go up there and luck into a seven pounder. However, you're going to catch 30 other fish that are 14 to 16 inches. Whereas if you come down south, if you're not catching above an 18 inch fish, you're not going to cash a check. That is interesting because we always talk about this from a, a fisherman's perspective, but not like a tournament director's perspective about like the other end of the spectrum, which is too many kayaks, too many participants and how you manage it on that end of the spectrum. So one of the biggest issues that we've looked at is, okay, there's a lot of really awesome bodies of water that we want to go to, right? A lot of really amazing fisheries, but then you look at it and you're like, okay, if we have an event on, I'm just going to throw one out there, Gifford Pinchot. Right, Gifford Pinchot in central Pennsylvania. It's in York County. It's an amazing fishery. There's so many three and four pound largemouth that live in that in that lake. Half of it's grass, grass, half of it's like deep water rock boulder, right? But there's so many good fish that live there. The problem is, is you can't put more than 20 boats on that place, 20 to 30 boats, and and have a successful event. Right. So now you're looking at okay, like, yeah, we would love to go there. We would love to go to that body of water, but the likelihood is, is that we're going to show up with 50 people and people aren't going to have a good time. Right. So there's some, like you have to find the right size fishery yeah. to match it, it, that, that right size fishery also has to have the right number of launches. And then, you know, that's, then, that's you have, true. then you have to worry about, okay, are people going to show up? Right. Because if you don't show up with the number that you expect to get, then you're like, well, I'm held it and we just have an event a gift for Pincho. Like, yeah. And then, but you don't want to fall into the same trap that people around my place do. It's like, well, let's go to the Tidal Potomac 57 times in a row. And yeah, then I it's like, I don't know. Like, that's annoying too, in my opinion. Yeah. I agree. I, I, I would love to mix it up. I would love to mix it up year after year. Some of that, though, is sponsorship driven. Right. True. If, if Charles County is going to, you know, continue to want us to come there, um, you know, we would be foolish not to go. Right. Um, and other other places, you could say the same. Um, but I would love to see multi-year partnerships like, hey, every other year we're going to come here. Right. Every other year we're going to go this place and have these multi-year partnerships where it's like, all right, you sign an agreement, we sign an agreement. And now all of a sudden we have locations picked for like three, four years in advance. I don't know if we're ever going to be able to get to that, but ultimately that would be the most ideal situation where you're able to break up the monotony of the same schedule over and over and over and over and over. And some of that's even just going to the fisheries at different times in the year. I agree with that one. Right. Yeah. So going to the Potomac in late April is vastly different than going to the Potomac in, say, July. Mm -hmm. Right. So, it, you know, there's there's probably a ton more water 
in play in July than there is in late April. And it is, it's just, it's the deal with the devil right now and how fishing industry works that you do need the money from these counties or, or these sponsors to go there. But, and I right. guess that's the positive, I guess, in what we live in. The negative is you go to the Sabine maybe 10 years in a row because they pay and it's like, oh my God. And I'm not saying any fishery that you go to the Sabine, but, and this is one thing I, I, I will give credit to the, the BPT. It's like, I forgot Dale Hollow was good until they went there this year because their format let them. It's like, oh shit. Yeah. There's big fish in there. Right. Like it, it's neat. And that's what I miss about bass too, is when they would go every now and then just put one crazy place in the schedule just to see places. Um, yeah. Well, so there's a lot more, there's other things that you, that you have to be taken into consideration too with kayak fishing is, so we have to ha find one, we have to find the right size body of water, right. For what our predictions are Two, it would be great to have sponsorship help. Right. So then finding a visitor's bureau that's willing to work with us. Three, having the right number of launches, right? Because you don't all want to have everyone launching from the same place because we don't have the, the range capability to go X number of miles away from the ramp and fish, right? So there's that aspect of it. And then there's the other aspect. And this sometimes is, is one of the most tricky ones. You'll find a great fishery, but the cell service is trash. That's a huge one, yeah. Right? How can you have a kayak tournament that you do all your submissions remotely via cell phone if you don't have cell service, right? So there's a lot of intricacies that go into picking these places. And then, you know, the ultimate one is you got to keep the anglers happy because if the anglers don't want to go to the fishery, then they're not going to show up. So it's, you know, it's a, it's, there's so many different aspects that have to be looked at for kayak fishing compared to, you know, boat fishing. Um, you know, most of our region, most of our region doesn't even have lakes that are big enough to have big bass, to big bass boat tournaments, right? You know, there's a few, but most of our, our fisheries, our fisheries kind of fit our size, but it still comes down to the other aspects then that you have to worry about. And that's, you know, the other, another thing too, Pennsylvania, I mean, Hmm. I am mixed feelings on it, but the, the closure of the spawn, right? Mid April through mid June, you cannot bass fish in Pennsylvania competitively. You cannot actively target bass while they're on beds in Pennsylvania. That is illegal to do. So then you have to worry about, okay, well, if we're going to go to Pennsylvania, we either have to go super early whenever we're going to have the risk of fishing in the snow or we have to go in the summertime when a lake like say Raystown is going to suck. Mm -hmm. It's going to be terrible June, July, August, because most of your fish are going to be in like 40, 50 feet of water. And then everyone's going to be out there and whoever doesn't have forward facing sonar is going to probably not do well. So you don't want to pigeonhole people either and, and force them into fishing a certain way. One of the things that's great about kayak fishing is being the wide range of what you can do and how, and how you can target the fish. And if you're doing it at certain times a year, sometimes it's not possible. And that, that was one of the reasons we front loaded our schedule this year. You know, most of our schedule happened between April and, and May mm -hmm. because it, it just worked out. We had two, two events per weekend, like four weekends between April and May. Are there any rivers, because I, I really do give props to the kayaking world for putting the Susquehanna on the map because the guides basically shut down, you know, live well tournaments there. It, it really made this place really, I think, known to the general populace. Are there other rivers like that, that kayaking could blow up and really make a thing? I'm thinking like the, not like the Nye River, places like that. Well, I mean, I think the, I think the upper stretches of the, the, the Potomac are doing really wow. good. Yeah. Um, you know, that's one. I mean, I think the Rappahannock could be another. Um, the James, the upper stretches of the James, could it could happen. Um, you know, the, the New River is another one. You know, the New River is, like, it's huge. First they off, went there but, at a bad time. They really did. Yeah, they, they really did. But, I mean, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's so many rivers that are so so much fun to fish. Um, 
some of the biggest struggle you have with rivers though is the amount of access points right because not every river is like the susquehanna where we have an access point every couple miles right mm-hmm. and we don't even have a lot when you really look at it when you look at the amount of aspect like our launch points that we have there might be a dozen public access points between Sunbury and Harrisburg. Hi dog. Um, but you know, you look at some other places and most of the river banks are privately owned, right? So you might have a 20 mile stretch of river that doesn't have a single public access point on it. So that makes it difficult. Um, but I mean, I think, I think the Rappahannock and the James are the ones that come to mind first. I think that there's really good fish on both of those river systems in the upper sections. I wish they would do a smallmouth series like that. Like start at the new and work your way up to the Susquehanna. Um, Trust me. (laughs) I, uh, I would love, I would, if there was a regional series that fished the new, the James, the rap, the Susquehanna, the Juniata, Shenandoah, Shenandoah. Yeah. Don't forget about the Doa, the upper Potomac. Like that would be an incredible series. And I think that you would draw people in from outside the region to fish that. Maybe we, maybe we just landed on a gold mine. Maybe we shouldn't put this in the podcast and we should just do this. Yeah. I mean, cause to find out once and for all, who's the best river smallmouth fisherman, you just hit all of them and we'll see who the AOI champ is at the end. So the, the AOI champ would be if he fished it, Jedediah Plunkert without a doubt. (laughs) Damn, you're not going to be the one? Listen, dude, Jed's a freak. Jed Jed can catch 20-inch smallmouth in mud puddles at the boat ramp. Mm. Like, that dude is a freak. Between him and Jody Queen, that series would be tough to win. If, if both of those two fished it, that series would be tough to win. I would love to get Jody on the show. But he, you want me to see if I can make that happen for you? And sometime, like the way you said that, though, it's like, like I'm just gonna take some pictures of him while he's sleeping. Nothing big. <laughs> I might already have some. Hold on. <laughs> God. Uh, because um, yeah, and, and then yeah, and also with the Jeff, I saw that Jeff that went down to the New River because like that place has just been freaking nuked, man. Oh my God. Hopefully that place comes back. It probably will. But. I'm trying to think, dude, like we pretty much just covered like every damn thing that's going on in your life. And hopefully like these next two events for you go well and smoothly from the political side and from the uh, fishing side. Dude, I, I tell you what, man, I'm I'm pretty, pretty set on throwing nothing but giant baits for these two last two events that I'm going to be fishing this year. Because I'm really I mean, I'm fishing for, you know, two or three fish and if I catch a 20, 22 inch smallmouth, could win me a couple thousand dollars, dude. Yeah, or put it on a leash and just wait for the right hour to like put it. No, up we're, there. We won't do that. No, we, we will won't not do that. do that. We will not do that. <laughs> oh my god. All right, um, guys, as always, link in the episode description, everything we talked about, a link to uh, Mid-Atlantic Kayak Association there. I'm not going to do the acronym because my brain don't like those words too much. Uh, go give them a check out. Go check him out on Instagram and YouTube. He does upload content to his Instagram, and he also has a YouTube account, so go check all that stuff out too. And we will see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.